So here's the first thing. If a person has a brain to gut access disorder, they're not going to fix it with digestive supplements for their gut. They may still need it to function properly because their brain isn't making them produce enzymes, so they may need to take enzymes. Their brain vagus isn't firing, so they can't get blood for the gut, so they have leaky gut. So they'll probably feel better taking digestive support and changing their diet and having a clean diet so they don't have as much inflammation and bloating and swelling, but that's not going to fix it. They have to start from brain down. And when you look at supporting from the brain down, you, you really can't just do it with a supplement. You have to develop plasticity. You have to develop connections, right? So neurons have to fire into each other for you to have your brain fire into your vagus, your vagus to fire into your gut nervous system, and then for those migrating motor complexes to work. And that neurological firing pathway not only helps motility, but it's the pathway that helps you neurologically release enzymes. Uh, and, and neurologically fire your parasympathetics to get blood flow to your gut. I want to back up a little bit, migrating motor complex. Dr. Right. Seebecker covered that, but just in case somebody didn't watch that, what does that mean? So the migrating motor complex is just a group of what they call motor neurons or muscle neurons, and your intestine cells have what they call smooth muscles, and those are the neurons that cause you to have your intestines contract and move okay. and control your valve function. Okay. But that's all controlled by brain function, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a person who's lost their brain gut access, we clinically know we can't just have them take a digestive supplement to treat it. And we go into three main things we do, and I cover this in my book. One of the first things we do is we have people gargle. And this is something that was done in the functional neurology world for a long period of time with people that had head injuries and things like that. But gargling, as you take water, put it in the back of your throat and go, blah, 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 blah. you fire those palate muscles which are fired by the vagus. Mm -hmm. And the key thing when we have patients do it is they sometimes understand the intensity they need to do it. They need to basically do it to the point they're tearing, you know? <laughs> so it's not like, Ugh. it's like they take the water back and go. You're, you're working it out. Yeah, and then the area of the vagus is right next to an area called the superior salivatory nucleus which causes you to tear. So if you hit the brainstem aggressively enough, you'll start to see the tearing. Mm -hmm. So we, we ask patients to, to gargle aggressively enough until they have tearing. And, and if this area is a part of the brain that's not functioning well, it's degenerated, um, uh, they're going to have a really hard time gargling. Or they may be a gargle for three or four seconds, or they just may choke, <laughs> mm -hmm. spit it out. So they may have to you know, start with a small amount of water and kind of build up. And over time, they can do it for several minutes really aggressively, and they're tearing, and they're tearing, and they're tearing. Mm -hmm. And that's like how you activate it through you know, an activation pathway. The other thing we have patients do is we have them take, you know, go to Amazon and buy like a box of tongue blades and induce a gag reflex, not on the back of their throat so they don't injure themselves, but just to push down on their tongue. If they push down on the back of their tongue, they'll feel like, like a little gag mm -hmm. and their eyes will start to tear. As they do that, they're actually firing that pathway. And it's just like having a weak biceps. If you have a weak bicep, you have to activate it by doing curls. If you have a weak vagus brain to gut connection, you have to activate it to really develop those connections and get that plasticity going. The third thing we do and this is really important, is we have patients do a coffee enema, but not, to, not for detox reasons. We want them to do is we want them to do a coffee enema, and the coffee has, nico uh, coffee has the caffeine, and the caffeine stimulates gastrointestinal nicotinic cholinergic receptors. So it makes their gut kind of move. That's why a lot of people that are constipated do coffee enemas. But we want them to get enough coffee and saturated enough so that um, they have to Force, they have to force themselves to suppress their bowel movements. So if they land their side into a coffee enema, they might have this urge to have a bowel movement. And if they don't have an urge, we need to have them increase the concentration of the caffeine in there. And then just, they just hang out there for as long as they can, suppressing their urge. Hmm. And as they suppress their urge, they're firing their frontal, pontine, vagal, enteric access. And if they keep doing that, they build endurance in there and they start to regain their brain to get access, right? You just hold it as long as you can? You hold it as long as you can and then you concentrate it as long as it can so it becomes difficult. It's like kind of adding, dump, you know, adding plates to your, to your, your French press, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, you have to mm -hmm. increase the intensity to make yourself work harder. So um, those three things we do seem to have a really good impact on impacting brain to get access. At the same time, we want them to have a clean diet and take digestive enzymes and support their intestines because we don't want the inflammation there because the pathway goes from gut to brain as well. But the most area that's neglected with a lot of chronic digestive people is failure in their brain to gut access. That's why I wrote a whole chapter about it in my book.